All right. Welcome, everybody. If you can hear the sound of my voice, that means we're going to start a poetry reading. So that means you shall adjust all television sets and uh, turn off all cell phones. Uh, if you are looking at something scandalous on your iPad right now using the free Wi-Fi, stop that and come and watch something more scandalous, which is live poetry. Yes. All right, I'm not promising scandal, but we can make scandal in our heads. Hi, everyone. My name is Robert Karimi. I am going to uh, say hello to you all. Welcome to, um, hold on, turn this, uh, to St. Paul Almanac's Lower Town Reading Jam. Let's give it up for yourselves. Give it up for yourselves. Yes. It is the warmest day of the winter so far, and you've decided to come here. That's awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, the lo again, the Lower Town Reading Jam is sponsored by the St. Paul Almanac. And um, the, their, the books for St. Paul Almanac are here. You can purchase them here at the Black Dog Cafe. Let's give it up for the Black Dog. <laughs> yes. Um, St. Paul Almanac is a literary organization that creates opportunities for understanding, learning, and building relationships through sharing people's stories. We'd like to thank our sponsors, and you can clap for them after I'm done with the list. This activity is made possible in part by funds provided by the Lower Town Future Fund of the St. Paul Foundation and support from St. Paul Neighborhood Network. I feel like I'm on a PBS. I can do that for a living. This is good. SPNN airs our shows throughout the month on their cable access channel. Let's give it up for the sponsors. Yeah, yeah. We'd also like to thank in the front with his pen and wine and a friend. Uh, give it up for our artist who will be drawing the poets tonight, Takumba Aiken. <laughs> and, and, and for those of you that are afraid of sitting up here, please sit up here. None of the poets, this is not Shamu, they will not wet you, okay? All right, since we're dealing with food and poetry, I just wanted to start us off with a little food poem. Um, and this goes out to all of you that have to deal with this during the winter. And you'll know what I mean. And this is called Meeting the In-Laws, a haiku. Avocado. Mmm. Smothered on carnitas. My Muslim girlfriend frowns. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. All right, I, it's a haiku, sir. We just, it's, I'm stuck at three, three lines. So, uh, <laughs> so here we go. Oh wait, oh, what's this for? I don't know, I like this though. Uh, so the title of tonight's show is called Double Hungry Sustainable Poems and it was curated by <laughs> Hyde Erdrich. So I'm going to introduce her. Let's give it up for Hyde, please. If you don't know who she is, she's amazing. Uh, but I'm going to tell you what I have here. This is cor this, I, this, if this isn't correct, I'll make it up, So, which would be fun, too. Uh, Hyde Erdrich writes, teaches, and collaborates with other artists across genres. She's the author of four poetry collections, most recently Cell Traffic, New and Selected Poems a recipient of awards from the Loft Literary Center, the Archibald Bush Foundation, the Minnesota State Arts Board, and First Peoples Fun Fund, Funk, I almost said funk, that would have been cool. Among other honors, Hyde won a Minnesota Book Award for National Monuments in 2009. Her newest book, Original Local, Indigenous Foods, Stories, and Recipes from the Upper Midwest, which is selling here tonight, is selling like Grandma Gourneau's corn cakes. Visit www.hideerdrick.com for more information, and uh, you could pick up Original Local right here tonight. So please give it up for Hyde Erdrick! Good evening. Uh, I have not turned off my cell phone because I am not going to be cut out not remembering what I <laughs> was about to say. Thank you so much, Robert Creamy. Thank you all for being here. Tacumba, everyone who is helping us out. 
Uh, I want to thank the Black Dog especially for making a menu based on items from the cookbook that I just wrote, Original Local, which for a poet is a really fun assignment because it means that we're that I'm able to write all the little notes that go with the recipes as really short prose poems. So I'll read a couple of those to you later at the end of our evening. But tonight I'm going to introduce our readers who have come out in the um, warm, as we call it here when it's above freezing in Minnesota in December, to read with me. And uh, I invited them because I wanted to hear them read. And I, when I got done picking the three people that were going to read with me tonight, I realized I'd picked the three most elusive poets in the Twin Cities. Um, I've rarely heard them read. I'm excited at this chance. I was stunned that they said yes. I was really excited about it. And uh, the first one is James D. Audio. And James is a visual artist as well as a poet. So I have that wonderful interdisciplinarity um, that I love inviting him here tonight. And I'm able to say that he's a uh, artist of note. He's been at the Vermont Studio Center for a residency, and his poems have been in North American Review, Drunken Boat, and other uh, magazines and journals. I love to read his poems. They have this complex rhythm and syntax, although they seem very short and slight. Just the, the effort of them and the intricacy of them is very beautiful. So uh, tonight, James is our first reader. I'm James. Hi, James. This first poem is something about toast. It's called yeah. Black Smoke of St. Peter's Square. Sunday with sharp serrated in hand, I saw a piece of loaf, wide but just so. With only the slight press and shimmy, I'd coax it into the toaster slot. God knows it likely won't return from down there, but I've managed to squish it in, red glow working its voodoo, and now I've only to wait, leaning, bedheaded, against my counter, yesterday's fruits from the loom. I just might stigmata my hand, but no. My mug of steam black drink scorches as upper lip dips over edge, drawing more air than Folgers. Christ, the neighbors can probably see me perched here overflowing my brief band, but it's my house anyway. Curtains, underpants. I could peel an orange, but it seems too much effort. Toast, where are you? For the love of God, come out of there. It's beginning to look like we can't even choose a pope. <laughs> I just have to say, when Hyde asked me to do this reading, I was very honored and I immediately accepted, and I was also quite stunned that I accepted. I do not come out and read very often, so you're very fortunate. I get to read tonight. I get to be here tonight. This one is called The Apples. Back when we ate the apples that the old man was saving for pies, he hoarse whispered from his porch, where he always sat upon a weathered Adirondack, lording over yard and field. We ran from the tree through the old man's lavender, which was indeed lovely. We ran clutching our treasure, made our way to a neighboring pasture upon which we lazed our afternoon. For years, I've replayed this scene. Old graybeard rising from his throne, leaning heavy on the rail, the running, the apples, and you, breathless in buttercups. Thank you. Some of my more recent work has been a little bit more experimental. I'm playing around with syntax. I'm pushing words together, just kind of seeing what kind of meaning comes out of it. So we'll see how this one goes. It's called Farmer's Market. Clinging bin, their tilted haunches receding, unbuttoned in the open air market. It is to a nimble rooster who pushed out the oily eggs. For this, the assemblymen having biscuits been terribly fingered outside these motion strands. Now when looking into each dream head, 
what were eased to a bent glance at. There are fields of electromagnetic dangle, swiftly took hold of the incandescent crop, often built on stitch particles that this chick picked clean. We're navigating a nearly packed proton cloud lashed to my brought coffee bottle. At Barrett Arch, even my crumb blossom formed. Anybody please raise your hand if you can tell me what that one was about. I have no idea either. <laughs> this one's called Lemon Poppy Seed. Windigo's on the move, foraging for roots, berries, meats. Young Ojibwe children huddle wide-eyed as elders tell legends of the creature that walks the winter wood. The massive man monster comes from the cold when Minnesota's moon of crusty snow is near half past and spring is still being beaten back by biting cold. Twigs and dry reeds glaze and drizzle freeze and the hairy man comes. The drum and flute that haunts reservation winters crescendos early, followed by the drawn out tinkling of shattered glass scattering across a frozen lake. Nourishment for wild creatures gro grows scarce. Cold morning, thatched fog, crows steaming upon posts, Windigo tromps from the deep wood, crosses the meadow and enters the Indian village. Iced walks are greased glass, and pedestrians don't trust their mucklucks should they need to run. Windigo crouches in shadow, tum rumbling. Sharp smell seeps from the caribou on every corner, hissing espresso for the cued crowds. Fruit to a funeral. This carriage bulks of fumed oak, she complains, but there's rain and her home is on my way, so she accepts and climbs in. Wet driver crops on horse hinds and we roll. My fingers fresh from orange peel press acid etched glass and just beyond the cloud glaze makes clay paste of the road. I fill my mouth with fruit. She's hungry, I know, but in a vague way and without pain. We can go all the way to the funerals, my dear, or you can just wait on the carriage bench seat in your clingy skirt with the corduroy cushion cutting treads down your backside, but she declines. The horse team pounds slipsod, mounting the jut, while to each roadside the dead sing white-lipped, craggle and sly. I pull on the window, tossing orange peels out. I'm pumped in my finger suit, primed to eat the plums, jam be damned. I'd even consider offering one, but here she's button-hooked, tied like luck and looking only to puddle leap home. She's quail and tummy rumbles. I'm knocking tooth to pit as we pound around the bend. Here's the family estate now. Stonework and ivy, maze of hedgerows, while inside the housemaid pulls large loaves from a cast iron. The smell of bread is heaven. Let me come inside. Funerary bells are ringing in the village. The horses are restless, but I don't want to leave. It's been raining a while. My fruit's all gone. You're cute as a hat. You're very polite. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> I have one more poem I'd like to read. This one is called That Haughty Morality. This is a pretty recent one. This one was just published in a journal called Yellow Medicine Review. I think Hyde had some things published in that journal as well. Yes? The former, the first. Okay. This one, to me, this one seems to be something about a chicken leg. I put the chicken leg back, the back leg of that chicken left that the chicken lay bereft of leg with egg of an egg sack filled for the market. I took for a market. I shall market ab absconded eggs. I hoist egg, hunched over my heavy sack, that sack that I had attacked the chicken to pull of it a back leg, that leg look, the leg that I took though put of egg, 
an extra little leg, and I walked with it, and the hen remains twisting in chicken scratch, moved over only by leftover leg. I left while chicken leg dangle, my lips moist on that dangle, for that which dangle hang upon such delicious bones, so much plump meat, moist meat so leggy to beak at, but for egg. That took egg in a sack, earmarked for market. I have it, the egg, and the little leg in my wet lips. Only then I regret, beg regret, which I had rarely known. I took leg back to bent hen, a grateful chicken in the dirt, left back that leg, leg that had that chicken backed, that back leg lay. I took egg, hoisted sack. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Woo! That was great. I love James's poems sometimes feel like carrying something heavy up and down the steps or carrying them da backward down the steps, the way they move back and forth with the same words. And damn jam, that was a good one. If you uh, haven't wondered, uh, the, if you want, the, there's a, this fist and the spoon. Uh, I'm, uh, I do a thing called The Cooking Show. We have a thing called The People's Cook. Uh, if you want recipes for the holidays, we have them for you. And I wore this for Hyde's book because I wanted to like be in solidarity because it says the revolution starts in the kitchen on the back. And so it's like, yeah. So what revolutionary doesn't have poetry and recipes in there, you know? Because I don't know about you all, but um, my mom, uh, excuse me, my aunt, my tia Carolina would, uh, put poems as markers for her recipes. And so I always remember that moment. So in, if you, you know, that's what we're doing today. So are you ready for me now? She's ready for me now. Give it back up for Hyde uh, Erdrich. Erdrich, yes, good. Hello again. Uh, this is really delightful for me. I hope it is for you too. Um, I have a couple of things to say before we go on to our third reader tonight. And one of the things is that um, uh, the previous reader, I really enjoy the idea of reminding us that hunger is need and food and other things that feed us have to do with need. Uh, and in that spirit, I am, have done my reading last night and a reading tonight uh, in order to be able to make a year-end donation to Dream of Wild Health which is in Hugo, Minnesota. It's an indigenous foods garden. They have begun a pilot program of doing the first ever indigenous foods CSA. And they work with native youth in the Twin Cities, have farmer's markets uh, uh, by the, the Midtown Y in the summer, and also over here in St. Paul. And the location's escaping my mind, I think near the elders home. So um, I'm happy to share with the need that I can meet in that way to some extent. But also um, I wanted to say that uh, I there's people here who made this little event take place and I'm really happy to have worked with you. Um, Kimberly and Nigel and Don and I can't, I'm like blinded, I can't see everybody to remember. And also other people here important to me, Clarence. And a little later I'll tell you about my husband because he's important to me too and to the, the work I do, like absolutely crucial. Right now we're going to get to hear from Kristen Naka, or Naka as I like to call her. Um, she's the author of Bird Eating Bird, which won a National Poetry um, Prize and uh, the National Poetry Series Prize. And she's also a teacher at McAllister College here in St. Paul. She moved here a little while ago, so she's new to the Upper Midwest, and we're really happy to have her here. Her work is published all over in Prairie Schooner, Indiana Review, and a lot of national um, organizations. Most recently, she wrote an essay about poetry and food, and I thought, wow, she's the person I want to hear tonight. So please join us in welcoming Naka. Hi, everybody. Um, I guess it is true. I, 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 I was thinking about whether or not I was elusive. And uh, I don't, I mean, I don't think I've read in the Twin Cities for more than a year, so I think that's, I'm getting there. So uh, I'll do the same thing as GE with my phone. 
And it was great to hear about, um, you know, Hyde's new book and that she was going to be having some readings with people reading poems about food. And I was like, oh, that's no problem. I don't write about food. <laughs> and I was like, well, maybe I have one poem. And then I was like, well, maybe I have four or five poems. <laughs> or maybe it's like a constant trope, but it's really just in the background. You know, all these kinds of excuses. But I'm, I'm really pleased she asked me to read tonight. So um, I always seem to write about different kinds, different places I've lived in. Um, and this poem is about uh, living in Seattle. It's called Grocery Shopping with My Girlfriend Who Is Not Asian. Through the doors gleam pyramids of apples, peaches, broccoli hybrids. I pronounce a name in Min, Gailan, pull back its leaves and reveal small white flowers, all to watch her mouth the words and make white flowers translations. She asks what Uppo is, and I tell her how my auntie grew the woody fruit next to foot-long beans, tomatoes my father claimed to grow on his own. If she needs more, I'll list ingredients like a poem, like garlic, onion, ground pork, and potatoes. Vegetables I don't have words for stew for an hour in that poem. We don't last long before the blitz of shiny packaging overwhelms her. One sea green cellophane submits to a lime, pea, then a teal wrapper, the lucky elephant or lotus stamp, the photographs of curious food items that luxuriate in broth, a cartoon sketch of a boy's face above some steam lines and a bowl, delight the, deli delight the angle that his eyes slant as he devours the noodles. Brands we differentiate by script, each lilt depicts the path a language takes to conquer, infiltrate, or drift. Some brush strokes end in a tip, sharp as my tongue when I dish out old-fashioned Asian lady barking. The aisles feed into a basin where aquariums line the walls and fish glint beneath fluorescent light bulbs. When I say, so gorgeous, I feel guilty eating them. That's not the half of it. Next week, we'll trade in excess beauty to shop at the market my mother took me. And I still shop as though my girlfriend and I had never met, where we fish beans from boxes, dodge old ladies throwing elbows at the fruit bins, scales unraveling off a fish when a butcher knocks the daylights out of it. And in time come the meals we dine on chicken that stinks of piss-soaked feathers. Thank you. Muy amable, as they say. Very nice. Um, I wasn't able to write a new poem for this reading, but I thought I would read a poem I very seldom read, so it's pretty new to me. <laughs> I hope not too new. It's called In the Time of the Caterpillars. Um, this poem is sort of like in this kind of weird, like just sentence space, sentence space sort of form. And it just is kind of elliptical. Auntie and Ning renders fat from slabs of pork she's cut into cubes. At the kitchen table, I render seen from the garden in Gethsemane in chalk. In the backdrop, a, st a greasy staccato. Sweeten your tongue on the roof of your mouth till E's come out, if you want to pronounce Auntie E's name. Today begins Elvis week, and E's heart pounds, Elvis sweetening her meaty lining. Though her name's the shape of an I, Auntie E's the shape of an O. In childhood photos, an O. A wonder she's ever known love. 
A returning GI, E's sweet on a girl rendered helpless when he loses her top in the staccato of waves. At the party that night, Elvis renders a song he sweetens with dance, a shag in his tail for the swoony damsels. When I look down, eyelids of apostles are sweetened shut from too much dust and all my overtouching. When Elvis clenches his jaw as someone else speaks, it's all his overacting. Too below Mississippi 1929, a child who would be a very tan king is born. On the TV, Elvis soothes the savage gypsies who store booty in a shiny caboose, the Acapulco cliff divers, shirtless trapeze artists, a tizzy of dizzy love-hung woman, seriously, devoutly, desperately nuns, bullfighters, make that one. Ah, uh, but Don Pedro, can this one sing? <laughs> All along, the black gum in our front yard fizzles with caterpillars. Locusts scorch the sky with a sticky torch song. In some other cases, the black gums rendered the black tupelo and the tupelo gum. In waves, the curious neighbors clench at the brown woolies barking up the black gums skin. Green surrenders to a staccato of O's, goes the leaves fading stomata. When the black gums leaves go faint and holy, my parents put their feelers on. At dusk, the dusty apostles also fade as Christ begs for strength in the face of death. How the silky caterpillars litter the pavement, falling through the holes they've eaten to death. With our fingers, we clench ice cream scoops between saltines, sweeten avocado with sugar and swoon. When Auntie E rings fizz from the O's of a sponge, her fingers bark from all the bleaching. She's as big as a house, mom and dad pound her when she isn't around or isn't looking. She steeps her branch in the murky water, fingers for the rice sweetening the bottom of the, plant, of the pan. Pick your poison, says the neighbor, a peevish red bud blooming in his yard. Gripped with love, I pound white rice until I'm full, white bread till I'm numb. A chalk of scorched meat on the bottom of the pan, an oily O on the chicharron rag. Outlines of apostles I've fingered into O's. Even scalded with grease, they keep sleeping. When dad starts with war buddies burning monkeys from trees, mom goes to sweep the brown woolies to the street. I gum on the chewy chicharron bark at the fatty white parts, hard swallow. If food is love, pound for pound, auntie Enings, a hunko hunko. <laughs> Wise men say when Christ calls, fill his jug with laughter, his eye sockets with song. No black people sun in blue Hawaii or fun in Alcapuco, ni viven in Las Vegas tampoco, leaving one explanation, too tan. In a canoe, Elvis fingers his tiny instrument. Oh, flaming ukulele of passion, ukulele of desire. What a gas, Dad pounds his foot, sweetening his story with the singed bodies fizzed. Elvis, have you ever known love? Have you ever never wanted the girl and still known love? A ticked off mom and dad tweeze bodies with fingers through their hair. I watch them in wonder through the kitchen window, the two O's in the front of my head.
Thank you. And now. Wait, wait. <laughs> How about I say it in Spanish? Y ahora. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> from, uh, where, where do you live now? Minneapolis. Minneapolis. Are you going to claim Minneapolis? I like St. Paul. Okay. She likes St. Paul, but from Minneapolis, Minnesota, please give it up for Hyde Erdrick. <laughs> I lived in St. Paul longer than I lived in Minneapolis, and I can safely say that after living in Minneapolis for a couple years, I figured out why people don't come from Minneapolis to St. Paul. And it's mostly because it takes longer, even though it's the same distance, and it's, you don't understand it till you live in Minneapolis. So thank you for those of you who came from Minneapolis to St. Paul tonight. When I moved here, uh, one of, actually, one of the readers tonight was one of the first people I met here because we had a little poetry scene in a bar, which was having moved here from the East Coast and where, you know, it was still very strange to be a poet. Um, I, I didn't live in New York when I lived on the East Coast. Grew up in North Dakota, moved to the East Coast. Um, and uh, it was so cool that we had a pub that we would actually close down. We had a poet pubs meeting and um, some of you might remember that. So it was hard to, Hard to leave St. Paul. I'm glad to be back here. I'm going to read from Original Local, which actually has poems in it. It's a cookbook. It has little stories, little anecdotes, some journalism, a little activism. Um, it's pretty much the whole buffet line of stories and food. There's only one thing I like more um, or would like to add to the whole combination of visual art performance and food, and that is any mention of Elvis. So thank you, Naka. <laughs> I loved that poem. It's a, it's a tour de force. I can see that you read it beautifully, but it's, it's a difficult poem to read. I just really appreciated it, because I know I, I'm imagining it on the page. I, thought, I imagined how, how much uh, stamina it takes. It was a great story. So yes, the furious passionate ukulele. I'm going to start with a little piece on manumen. There's samples of manumen. If you've never had hand harvested manumen and you think that wild rice is that hard black stuff that takes 40 minutes to cook, you are wrong. That is a cultivated product that has been and will continue to be manipulated. It is generally not grown by native people and not in their control, although there are some native um, groups that do grow cultivated wild rice. But how do you call it wild when it's cultivated? I don't know. Original manumen is something else, and it's very beautiful and varied, and a lot of people have a very strong relationship with it. It comes as a part of spiritual belief for Ojibwe people. And this is a short piece called Food That Grows on Water. It may be that I was born in the birthplace of manumen, the food that grows on water, told of an Ojibwe prophecy. It may be that the Ojibwe came west in search of this food, as our traditions tell. And it may be also that the source of that rice was my hometown river. And as early Pian European visitors to the area were told, according to Thomas Venom's um, Wild Rice and the Ojibwe People. That's a uh, scholarly book, but quite interesting. Maps tell stories even when the names are translated. The Red River of the North flowed just underneath the window of the hospital room where I was born. Tributaries of the Red, which became the border between Minnesota and North Dakota, include two rivers, both called Wild Rice. I do not know if Manuman still grows on the Wild Rice River in North Dakota, but I know it did when I was a girl. My first memories of rice, my first memory of wild rice is of my father harvesting the long, thin grains with a neighbor and hauling them home. Recently, when I asked my father when that was, he thought it was maybe 1969 or 1970. And that fits with my sense of how old I was at the time. I have a glimpse of memory of a blue plastic kiddie pool filled with manumen, ready for processing in the yard between our house and the Warrens, our neighbors from White Earth, who eventually ran a large ricing operation on the reservation in Minnesota. 
Ricing was not our family tradition. So not long ago, I asked my dad how he came to harvest Monoman on the Wild Rice River. As we talked, my mother slipped out of the door. I assumed she was bored with us. But soon she returned from her canning cache in the basement to produce a jar of rice from that very harvest. In a beautiful old glass jar composed of rings to, composed of rings to create a shape like a honey scap, there remained several cups of long, very thin rice, smoky brown manumen, less opaque than the Minnesota lake rice. Astoundingly, it looked perfectly edible. I opened the jar and it smelled of parching kettles, wood fire, and river water all at once. 44 years old, and I would eat that rice today, but I don't. Mom says she keeps it in a cool spot in the cellar and that she would use it for special occasions. I think of all the enormous moments in our large family's history, births, graduations, weddings, awards, more births, deaths, times of need and times of rejoicing, and I wonder just what occasion was my mom waiting for? My mother gave me some of the manumen, which we'll keep to help remember that long ago adventure and in the hopes it might one day be of interest to those returning manumen to the rivers in our region. So that goes along with a lot of discussion about how manumen is um, used uh, in various types of cooking, sweet and savory, um, ways you'd expect and ways that we invented. Um, my husband John worked with me on the cookbook quite a bit and I wanted him to put his name on it and be my co-author and he said, well, I didn't write any of it but I know I washed every dish. <laughs> <laughs> so he was the baker, too. But I couldn't, like I said, I had to put some poems in it, so I have a poem. This one's called What Gathers. It's about berry picking, so it's on the opposite time of year when it's very hot and everything is starting to get ripe. What Gathers. Twisting stems weave green to red against leaves, raindrop shaped and tender, shelter for blue-black berries. We taste pure purple. We gather. We touch our tongues to juice we've asked to grow for us. We, children in our northern gardens, gather dark sweetness of Saskatoons, indigenous fruit that taught Ojibwe beadwork patterns of vine and leaf, winter's longing worked by hand, reminder of a hot day to come, promise bright against threat. Doubtless that was part of it, what was gathering long ago, the rush of other, the great change, foods, woods, bison, prairie, gods, goods, songs, all about to alter. We touch our tongues to summer, what gathers now we do not know, some low rumble on the globe's edge. We gather, nail tips and lips stained, we do not, we do as our blood asks. These berries, the same berries our ancestors plucked, rolling thumb against the curved edge, teasing ripeness, readiness, old ladies joking, find me a man can handle a woman like that. Swoon in July, sun in sensual asks, in sensual acts, the fruit asks. We gather, chilled still by long winter, always just behind us, always just ahead. So. Thanks. Sometimes when I ask people for, um, a recipe, they just gave me a list of ingredients, which I called the cast of characters, or they sent me a poem. So this one's called La Graine, dried choke cherry cake, cha cakes. Choke cherry, does anybody know, do you know cho what choke cherries taste like? A few of you? Um, uh, they, they were the main ingredient in wild cherry cough drops from a very familiar cough drop company for many years, and that's not the best version of it, but you can kind of have a sense that wild cherry 
very important in Lakota cosmology and a very, very important food to a lot of people of the um, Great Lakes, Great Plains, but not often eaten. Um, it was a favorite, and people were very jealous about their choke cherry patches when I was growing up, and um, uh, we still get choke cherry every year. This is called Le Grand Dried Choke Cherry Cakes, and it's from my friend Denise Lajamadir, who's a poet, who um, I asked for her choke cherry recipe, and she sent me this. After the first freeze, go out into the Turtle Mountain bush to your favorite spot. You keep it secret from all your cousins and pick some choke cherries when they are sweetest. You won't have to fight mosquitoes or ticks. Have your grandchildren help you pick. Pound the choke cherries on your cucum's flat rock using her oval-shaped pounding stone that fits snug in your hand. Grind the pits as finely as you can. Shape the pounded berries into small cookies and lay on an old window screen. Put on top the lean-to where they will dry slowly in the North Dakota sun. Store in a cracker tin. On Thanksgiving Day, put a couple cookies worth in a cast iron skillet with some water and set over a low fire. When stuffed and starting to smell like summer, add sugar and a pinch of flour to thicken. Stir in some bacon grease and fry it up a little. Put a small amount on all your relatives' plates, kids too, and tell them they have to eat it, pits and all. The last two pieces I'm going to read in here have to do with um, the fact that I grew up in the 70s. And a couple days ago, Tom Laughlin passed away. Did anybody know who Tom Laughlin is? Yeah, great hero to a lot of Native people. Not a Native person, but a great hero. He played, he invented, played, and produced the Billy Jack movies. And uh, I had always had him in my sight of uh, cosmology as one of my heroes. So you may not get all the references to Billy Jack, but those of you who do, this is for you. Cowboy kickers, beans, and weas. Weas is dried meat. And um, I have several recipes where I encourage people to use dried meat, uh, wasna, weas, beef, beef jerky, not beef jerky, but bison jerky, and other jerkies from indigenous animals to get used to that meat. And also to get used to the idea that people didn't have slabs of meat. They used a little bit of meat in their food, and usually dried meat. And this is the way we survived for a long time. Sometime in the 1970s, some Don Draper advertising genius urged everyone to make cowboy beans by adding barbecue sauce to canned beans to serve at cookouts. Well, that was also the era of Billy Jack, the Indian hippie B-movie hero who took off his socks to kick racist behinds. These tribute beans are made from sauce from Ojibwe restaurateur, famous Dave Anderson. Yeah, yeah. Did you know he was Ojibwe? Not everybody knows that. Um, everybody like really famous except Elvis was Ojibwe. <laughs> uh, famous Dave Anderson and dried meat, which we call weas. They could be made vegetarian, like Billy Jack's weeping washed out blonde pacifist girlfriend. Violence is not the answer, Billy. To paraphrase Billy Jack, I'm going to take these beans and whop them right next to some bread, and there's not a dang thing you're going to do about it. These beans are for you, Billy Jack. So good, you'll go berserk. So in the recipe, you get olive oil, red onion, two cups of black beans drained, uh, 1.7 ounces beef jerky, or bison jerky, sorry, cut into bite-sized pieces, but it's optional for pacifists who want to kick we ass. Some devil spit famous Dave, some maple syrup, and some sun-dried tomatoes. Cook it all up and it's good. Cook it in a can if you want the authentic experience. All right, so that's one of them. And the last recipe I'm going to share with you is not for sour cream and craisin pie, but uh, Black Dog Cafe and Wine Bar made sour cream and craisin pie from John Burke's recipe. That's John back there. You want to wave? So <laughs> and 
I would just say, what if somebody made a pie with craisins instead of sour cream and maple instead of sugar, and then somebody would? It's like a miracle at my house. It's just wonderful. And then I wanted to come up with a recipe for something with wild plums. Do, have any of you ever picked wild plums? They're, they're a little different from regular plums. They look a little different. They're more yellow. But when you cook them, they turn about the same color as regular plums. We used to go out to farmers' um, windbreaks and shelter belts to, to harvest the wild plums. We would ask for permission, and we would go um, with my family, and we'd fill you know, big five-gallon pails with them. Wild plums. The frosty pink skin is sour, to be sure, but tender. And the yellow interior glows with sweetness easily coaxed by cooking. We walked to shelter belts and parked alongside drainage ditches, went out and force and picked enormous buckets of wild plums from small trees so loaded that the memory of their smashed sunset of spilled fruit marked itself forever on my child's mind. Wild plums, as psychedelic a display as my older siblings' tie-dyed t-shirts. I ate so many once that now just a little has the taste and tang of stomach ache to me. I go easy on the raw plums, but would happily cook down a pound to make a sweet and sour sauce for duck or fish and have enough left over for a breakfast of wild plum clafu tea. And then the recipe for wild plum, plum clafu tea, I'll finish with this. I'll tell you what's in it first. There's wild plums, but you could use regular ones if you needed. Chambord, if you've got it, which is raspberry liqueur. Four eggs, coconut milk, maple syrup, vanilla, uh, some butter or sunflower butter, which we actually used here a long time ago. Um, a little bit of flour, a tiny bit, some sugar, and salt. My love loves me, and I know because he makes me clafu tea. The most tender and simple way to treat fresh fruit is all Frenched up in name, but down home in fact. There's nothing more lovely to put to your lips except, of course, a kiss. Thank you. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. The fabulous drawing by Takumi Aiken. Oh, I love it. <laughs> the energy goes on forever. <laughs> That's how recipes are. All right, it says Elvis and Choke Cherry. I never knew it would happen together, but it's finally come together. Yeah.